So I am Hippocrates Cyrus. I'm the director of King's Fertility in London. I'm a physician by uh, a trade, let's say, by background, but obviously a great interest in this entire field and following throughout all the developments. And really, when they asked me to um, chair this session, the first thing that came to my mind, okay, well, what is poor prognosis and uh, what is it all about? And really, it's pretty simple, isn't it? We all know it's uh, one egg, one sperm that has to meet at the right time at the right place. What can be more difficult than that? But actually, if we go into a little bit more detail, what it really is about is one normal egg, finding one normal sperm, creating one normal embryo, which then has to be at the optimal time, at the optimal place. And really, that's where everything starts becoming sort of more interesting. So when you sort of look at the concept of poor prognosis, there's not really a very good definition. Um, are we talking about people with poor ovarian response? Is it recurrent implantation failure? Is it re recurrent pregnancy loss? All of these are part of sort of what a poor prognosis patient is. For me, it's much more, and we'll come to that in a moment. But effectively, these are sort of three key areas that most of us sort of come in contact with in our daily practice. The problem is we don't really know how many of these uh, people exist in a sort of clinic, and it all really much depends on how you define this population, which is the problem in the first place. So if you look sort of at the varied definitions of poor ovarian response, and then you try to apply it into a sort of normal IVF clinic population, it can be anywhere from as low as 5% to as high as 35%. That sort of tells me that we haven't really defined this population properly. When it comes down to recurrent implantation failure, again, lots of definitions, but by and large, about 10% of our patients will sort of uh, fall in this category. And recurrent pregnancy loss, another interesting one, which transcends not just what we see every day in our sort of uh, ART clinics, but also the general population, we think it approximately affects 1% to 2% of women. And of course, we all know how inefficient we are as humans uh, in our reproductive sort of uh, journey compared to other uh, species. And this is sort of a very old sort of concept that actually if we looked at uh, sort of 100 pregnancies, uh, only a very, very small proportion will actually make it to live birth. So the question is, is this is just nature and we're fighting against nature or is there something we can do about it and hopefully improve things on the way? So again, Coming back a little bit to sort of the definitions of uh, some of the things we're going to talk about today, so recurrent implantation failure. Now, this is not necessarily the definition that everybody uses, but it sort of is the one that stuck to me the most because it talks about three or more successful IVF cycles, but complete cycles. So actually, we're talking about failure of conception after the replacement of 10 or more good quality embryos. I think this is important. I'll touch upon it in a moment. And the causes can be pretty varied, really. It can be anywhere from egg problems, sperm problems, problems with embryo endometrial development. But also what more and more we're understanding is that it's not just necessarily what is inherent to those sort of gametes and the environment. It's also what we do in our everyday practice as clinicians. So more and more evidence is emerging, as we all know, about the impact of our stimulation protocols, what sort of drugs we use, um, how we trigger, maturation, ovulation, and potential effects that they have on hormones and then the luteal phase support and the receptivity of uh, the endometrium. So it's not necessarily just inherent to the patients that we treat, but it's possibly a lot of it has to do with what we do to treat our patients. I guess when it comes down to recurrent pregnancy loss, this is the most accepted uh, sort of definition. We have three consecutive pregnancy losses prior to 20 weeks of gestation. Again, there's a lot of sort of chatter about if this is a little bit too wide and really you have to sort of have six or seven losses to be able to really start picking up the people that have sort of the inherent problem. But again, once more, when we look at the causes of it, they're very, very wide and ranging and for a lot of them, we still don't know what's going on. It can be down to genetic abnormalities of the pregnancy itself. It can be because of either acquired or hereditary thrombophilias, immunological causes, uh, metabolic and endocrinological causes like thyroid dysfunction and polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, uterine malformations, uh, or other abnormalities of the uterus that a woman can acquire throughout her lifetime. And of course, what we more and more seem to be appreciative 
is that a lot of this is down to the men, not just the women. I probably spent most of my career in reproductive medicine, uh, I wouldn't say accusing, but sort of pointing the finger towards women. That was all about them and their age and their eggs. And more and more we're realizing that it's actually not just that. So how do most of these patients present to us? Well, some of them are predicted. You know from the outset that's going to be a, you know, a difficult journey for them. They're usually identified during the uh, workup phase prospectively. And you know, as a pretreatment probability, the success is very low. And very common, the underlying cause is known. Examples of that, obviously, is advanced female and male age, poor ovarian reserve, severe sperm abnormalities, or anatomical abnormalities like fibroids or Asherman syndrome, and severe endometriosis and adenomyosis. And we've sort of all seen these sort of sync, heart sink moments when you scan the ovary and you see one sort of sad follicle looking back at you, or you have a uterine abnormality where, well, you really can't do anything about it, uh, or the women with a severe adenomyosis. And really, when you start having to dig inside the testicle to find sperm, you know it's not going to do as well as a man that has a normal semen analysis. Maybe a lot of you do not come across this sort of fibroid picture that I see a lot in my practice, but sometimes it's heart sinking when you get these beautiful blastocysts that my embryologists have worked hard to be able to, to give us. And then we've got this uterus. No matter how many myomectomies you do, it's never going to be normal. And of course, sometimes you have iatrogenic jamage, that's a syndrome, of, that's an Asherman syndrome picture. Some of them you can uh, repair, some of them more dif difficult. But the real key are the ones that are unexpected. These are patients that you thought they should do well, and then you only pick them up because they had unsuccessful treatment or multiple unsuccessful treatments. And these are patients which are identified retrospectively. They never had warning that this will be a problem for them. And very often, the cause is not known. It's unclear. And this is the one which is the most frustrating for the patient. It's easy to be able to look at the fibroid or an abnormal uterus and say, well, you know, X, Y, Z, or, you know, you're 45, what did he expect sort of thing. But it's more difficult when you go to them. Everything looks absolutely fine. I just don't understand why you're not getting pregnant. And, of course, again, the reasons are varied. And how they present, well, I'm sure we've all come across the women with the unexpectedly poor response to stimulation, sometimes we can change that with changing the regime in sort of the next cycle. And a lot of them, up to 40% of women with the first cycle with uh, unexpectedly poor response to stimulation will actually do much better in a second cycle. Sometimes we come across women that have failed fertilization. It happens both with IVF and with ICSI. Or despite everything looking good, you have poor embryo quality. And of course, the sort of dreaded category of recurrent implantation failure of good embryos. And of course, you have to ex exclude the women that you know there's another reason, like having fibroids. And lastly, but definitely not least, pregnancy loss. That's very, very uh, devastating for, for most women that uh, have to suffer with this. So the key challenge when we treat these people with poor prognosis, and especially that sort of second category of unexplained, the ones that we see only retrospectively, is that it has a very sort of big burden uh, of, of, of treatment and uh, uh, an emotional sort of, uh, 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 sort of um, uh, cost to these uh, couples. Of course, they have multiple attempts. Uh, there's an increased time to pregnancy if they become pregnant. And there's a very high dropout rate. So really, this is a very challenging and interesting group. Of course, we have to understand it first to be able to uncover the etiology for poor ovarian response, recurrent implantation failure, and recurrent pregnancy loss. And of course, we need much more research and new tools for our arsenal to be able to, to treat this very challenging group.